Prayer is such an important part of the Christian life. And one of the ways we know this is that Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount, which we're currently going through, did teachings on prayer twice, one in Matthew 6 and one in Matthew 7. And today we're going to be looking at what Jesus said about prayer. And Jesus already taught us how to pray in the Lord's Prayer. And now Jesus gives us the assurance of prayer. Jesus tells us how our prayers are answered by God most certainly. Jesus gives us hope and faith when we pray. But before we, get into, when, but before we get into it, would you please join with me in a word of prayer? Dear Lord Jesus, thank you, God, for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you, God, for sharing your word with sinners like us, God. And thank you that we can read your word and understand your word and that your Holy Spirit illuminates the word to us, God. Lord, please speak to us through your word, God, and please put all distractions aside. And God, just speak, God. Speak powerfully, God. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So open with me to Matthew chapter 7, and we'll be in verses uh, 7 through 12. And we're going to learn a lot about the blessedness of prayer. And Jesus will also teach us the golden rule. Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father, who is in heaven, give good gifts to those who ask of him? Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. J.I. Packer and his wonderful book, Knowing God, which is probably one of the best books you could ever read apart from the Bible. It's a, it's a terrific book. He said this about prayer. He said, people who know their God are before anything else, people who pray. And the first point where their zeal and energy for God's glory comes to expression is in their prayers. The invariable fruit of true knowledge of God is energy to pray for God's cause. Energy, indeed, which can only find an outlet and a relief of inner tension when channeled into such prayer. By this, we may test ourselves. Prayer is a very, we often don't think of it like this, but it is a discipline. And prayer is a very hard discipline. If there's one way you could pray for me, it's that I would pray more. Because you could never pray enough. But in fact, in the Christian life, one of the things most Christians do the least is pray. And it's uh, to our loss and it's to the loss of the church as a whole that Christians have forgotten how to pray. And even worse, Christians have forgotten to pray. And the question that I have for you as we go through this is how do you, often do you pray? And I know it's not about, oh, I get up and pray four hours every day. It's not about time necessarily. But how often do you spend time in God's presence? How often do you spend time worshiping God in prayer? How often do you spend surrendering to your needs, to God in prayer? How often do you spend submitting yourself to God, asking God to reveal sin in your life, asking God to kill the flesh in you, asking God to help you take up your cross? How often do you spend time doing these things? Prayer is the heartbeat of the Christian. If you're spiritually lethargic, if you're spiritually stagnant, if you're backsliding, if you're having a hard time battling with sin, if you're losing the fight with temptation, I assure you it's because one, you do not pray, and it's because two, you're not in the word enough. Prayer is an essential of the Christian life, and every true Christian prays. Now, that doesn't mean every true Christian prays all the time. And oftentimes, and myself included, Christians forget to pray. We don't make time for prayer. But every Christian prays, whether it be a little bit of time or a whole lot of time, every Christian prays. And if you don't pray, that's a serious problem. And if you pray little, you're going to see little in your life. It's just the truth. And it's a sad fact that the Christian church has forgotten to pray. And I believe it's God's judgment that we see so little of the Holy Spirit in our churches. We see so little of his power. And that's because we've forgotten to pray. We've forgotten to seek God, the Holy Spirit. We've forgotten to ask God for God's leading in our life. And some Christians, are, it's shocking they're okay that they don't pray. Oh, I'm not one of those guys who prays. No, every Christian should desire to pray more. 
If you want to draw near to God, the only way to do it is by reading his word and praying to him and worshiping him and praising. We must pray. It's a vital necessity. With that said, oftentimes when we go to prayer, we have doubts that our prayers are heard. We have doubts that our prayers are answered. But look at what Jesus says. Look at the assurance that Jesus gives us. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Look at the promise there. That's a powerful promise. Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. All you need to do is ask. He doesn't say you have to ask in a very fanciful, very eloquent way. He just says to ask. And he says, if you ask, it will be given to you. Now, oftentimes, this passage is taken out of context. And people say, well, oh, if I ask anything, it's going to be given to me. Well, we have to understand that this sermon that I'm preaching right now, this is an isolated event. With an is I'm isolating the text. But this text goes with the whole Sermon on the Mount, which is, covers three chapters in Matthew. The whole Sermon on the Mount, and this is just a part of that. So we have to put this passage of scripture in context with the Sermon on the Mount. And even more than that, we have to put this passage of scripture in context with the whole of scripture. So when Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you, it doesn't mean that if you just ask for anything, it's for sure going to be granted. Give me a billion dollars. Well, no, not necessarily. You might, but it's not, it's not going to happen necessarily just because you ask for it to God. What Jesus has taught all throughout scripture and what he teaches in the Sermon on the Mount is that we must ask according to God's will. And that's what we have to understand about this passage, is when Jesus is saying, ask and it will be given to you, he's saying, if you ask according to my will, if you ask according to the Father's will, it will be given unto you. But understand this, if you're asking for something that's outside of God's will for you, that's not going to be a granted prayer because a loving father would not give you something that's going to cause you to sin, would not give you something that's going to harm your life. And how aren't you glad that some of the prayers you have asked have not been granted unto you? I know in my life, I've asked tons of prayers and I'm, I'm grateful to God that he's not given me the answer I at first desired. Now, with that said, every prayer is answered. There's no unanswered prayer. But God answers prayer in three ways. Yes, no, or not yet. And we have to accept God's answer as hard as that be. But we can know that when we pray according to God's will, it will be given to us. Now, how do you pray according to God's will? You bring out his word. You hide his word in your heart. You memorize scriptures so that when you go to prayer, you pray scripture. When you're praying for somebody, you say, God, you're a loving God. You're a, great, you're a gracious God. You said you came into the world that whoever believes in you should not perish by eternal life. Please save this person. Please heal this person of their spiritual sickness. That's how you pray. You pray God's word forth because he has to answer his word. He has to answer his promises. He's an immutable and changing faithful God. He must answer his promises. And that's the assurance we have when we pray. Now, Jesus says, seek and you will find. He said, ask and it will be given. So we go to God and ask. But he says, seek and you will find. We have to do more than just ask. We have to seek. In Jeremiah 29, 13, Jesus, uh, well, excuse me, God speaking to the prophet Jeremiah says, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. We have to seek after God. When we ask for something, when we ask God to make us holy, we have to seek it. We have to seek it in God. We have to seek it in his word. We have to seek it in our actions. We have to take action. Our prayer should produce in us action. It's not just a dormant prayer. We don't just pray it and just let it sit there. No, we take action. We ask God to use us, and then we seek opportunities to be used. It's a partnership. Jesus says, knock, and it will be open to you. Even more than seek, you have to knock. So we ask, then we seek, and then you've got to bang on the door of God's heart. You've got to knock. You've got to plead to God. You've got to beg him. And it's not because it's Jesus is teaching here that, oh, if you're persistent enough, you're going to win out in the end. No, that's not what Jesus is teaching. 
Persistence in prayer is a beautiful thing, but that's not the essence of this teaching. The essence of this teaching is God's a loving father. He wants to give you good things, but you must first come to him. You must first seek him. You must put some effort into it. That's what Jesus is teaching. Then he reassures us further. He says, for everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. If you ask, you will receive. If you seek, you will find. And if you knock, it will be opened. You look at the promises of God. They're amazing. Now, this is actually something I want to bring up about prayer because it's a point that I've grappled with and it's something a lot of people have grappled with and something perhaps you've grappled with. Some of us think, well, why should I even pray if God in his foreknowledge and in his foreordination has already caused everything to pass? Doesn't God's foreknowledge make things necessary? Because God foreknows something, is it necessarily the fact that it's going to happen? Why even then should I pray? But that's a big misunderstanding. God's foreknowledge does not make things necessary. God's foreknowledge makes things certain. So, for instance, say that you're going to go out today and you're going to go to work. Well, God foreknew before you actually even went to work that you were going to go to work. And some people think, well, therefore, it's necessary that you go to work because God foreknew it. But that's not the case. It's just certain that God knew it. If you didn't go to work that day, God's foreknowledge would be different. And he would know that you didn't go to work that day. So it's a big misunderstanding that we ought not, that we, it doesn't make sense to pray because God's foreknowledge has made everything necessary and everything is already meticulously planned out. That's not true. Prayers change things. Prayers change lives. Prayers change the course of human events. Prayers move God's heart to take action, to relent of his, of his wrath, which is coming one way or another, but to postpone it further. Prayer does change things. And don't ever think to yourself that prayer doesn't change things. Don't ever think to yourself that somebody's too lost that you can't pray for them. Don't ever think to yourself that you can't change something through prayer. No situation is too dire for God. With God, nothing is impossible. And then here Jesus says kind of an interest. He gives kind of almost something of a parable, but not necessarily, but it's very similar. He says, what man is there among you? who if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone. And Jesus is asking a rhetorical question. Of course, the answer is there is no man. I mean, perhaps there's some sicko out there in the world, but no father, if his son comes and says, Father, I'm hungry, give me bread, is going to hand his son a stone. That's a cruel father. And even evil human men know that when their son asks for bread to give them bread, he doesn't give them a stone. Jesus says, or what man is there among you? Or if he asks for fish, Will he give him a serpent? If your child came and asked you for a fish, would you give him a snake to bite him? Of course not. The answer here is obviously not. Jesus then says, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask of him? And Jesus is working from the lesser to the greater. He's saying, look at you sinful men. You know that if your child is hungry, you're not going to give him something that's going to harm him. You're going to give him what he asks for if it's in your power to do so. But the heavenly father, who is perfect and above all else, will he not do far greater? Will he not give you good gifts when you come to him? Have that assurance that when you go to God, he wants to bless you. If you're his child, he thinks good thoughts towards you. He loves you. He wants to pour out his riches upon you. I'm not talking financially. I'm talking spiritually. And sometimes it is financial. But God wants to bless his children. God wants to give good gifts to his children. But we must come and ask. How different would your life be if you came to God and asked him for good gifts? If you came to God and asked him to change your heart. If you came to God and asked him to draw near to you. How different would your life look? But you can do it now. Right now, you can go to God in prayer and cry out to him and submit to him and ask him to change your life and ask him to change your heart and ask him to give you a new mind and a new spirit and renewing you a steadfast heart for his glory. God wants to do this for us. Now, notice here, Jesus affirms the doctrine of original sin. 
And the doctrine of original sin is that every human, because of the fall of Adam, is born in sin. You're born a sinner. You don't, you're not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you're first a sinner. Every person is a sinner because of Adam's fall. And that's the doctrine of original sin. And it's taught all throughout scripture, cover to cover, Old Testament to New Testament, Genesis to Revelation. It's taught in scripture. And here Jesus affirms it. He says, if you being evil, talking about men, if you being evil, he points out men are evil. He says, he throws in here the entire human race, all are evil and fallen. And we need God. And Jesus here beautifully affirms the doctrine of original sin, which is under such heavy attack. And it's a terrible thing because it, people are trying to eliminate the need for grace. People are trying to eliminate the need for salvation. It's a terrible, terrible thing. It's, it's, it's honestly horrible. But Jesus here beautifully affirms the doctrine of original sin. And then Jesus closes here. And it's kind of an interesting close. Well, we'll close this portion off with the golden rule. He says, therefore, and when somebody says, therefore, you have to see what it's there for. So knowing what Jesus just said about prayer, knowing how good God is to us, and also thinking about the whole Sermon of Mount, God's talking about God's goodness, God's righteousness, God's law. Jesus, summing up here, he says, therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Now, how amazing is this verse? And how challenging is this verse? Whatever we would want men to do to us, we must do also unto them. This is a verse that should keep us from sin. Whenever you're tempted to sin or whenever you're tempted to do evil against another man, you should think to yourself, is this what I would want him to do to me? Constantly think to yourself, it'll save you from so much sin. Now, uh, oftentimes critics of the Bible will point out, and it is true, that Jesus was not the first one to come up with the golden rule. In fact, ancient civilizations from the beginning of time have had the golden rule. And uh, Rabbi Hillel, he was a very great Pharisee before the time of Jesus. One day a person asked him to teach him the whole Torah while he was standing on one leg. And Rabbi Hillel says, whatever you hate men, whatever, he put it in the negative form. He says, whatever you hate for people to do to you, don't do that to them. So he puts it in the negative form. He says, Whatever you don't want people to do to you, don't do that to them. So it's in the negative form. But Jesus takes it further, and our historians will confirm this, that Jesus is the first one to put the golden rule in the positive form. And Jesus says, whatever good you want men to do to you, do also to them. Don't only do the, uh, follow the negative form of the golden rule. Don't only not do to men what you don't want them to do to you, but do to men what you want them to do to you. If you want people to treat you kindly, treat others kindly. If you want people to love on you, love on others. Jesus puts in the positive form, but Bible commentator Leon Morris, some people say it doesn't matter if it's negative or positive, but look what he has to say to this. He says, if we did nothing at all, we would satisfy the negative form. In the great judgment scene in chapter 25, those who are condemned might well claim that they had fulfilled the golden rule in its negative form. Their condemnation lay in the fact that they had failed to do good. Don't only not sin against others, but do good unto others. That's the beautiful part of this positive form of the golden rule. Whatever good you want men to do unto, them, unto you, do also unto them. Knowing, therefore, because God is so good unto you, knowing because God is such a great heavenly father who does so much good unto you. In closing, Spurgeon speaking on prayer, he said, we cannot all argue, but we can all pray. We cannot all be leaders, but we can all be pleaders. We cannot all be mighty in rhetoric, but we can all be prevalent in prayer. And that's my prayer for you, is that you be prevalent in prayer that you be a mighty pleader before God, that you pray that God raise up a generation that's ready to stand upon his truth. You pray that there be revival in the church, that there be reformation in the church, that there be spiritual awakening in the church, that God would send his Holy Spirit upon us and there would be signs and wonders once again, that God's Spirit would pour out upon us in a mighty way. Would you close with me and join in a word of prayer? 
Dear Lord Jesus, thank you, God, for your word. Thank you, God, that we know when we pray at Cornelia Real, we are assured that, God, it will be answered. And God, we pray, Lord, that right now there's so much evil in the world. There's so much wickedness in the world, God. Lord, please, please bring an end to it, God. Jesus, please raise up a generation of Christians who are going to stand upon the truth. Please, God, bring boldness to the church, God, to stand upon the truth of your word and to defend your word, God, and to love your word, God, and to teach your word, God. Please, God, give us energy and vigor to pray, Lord. Strengthen us to pray, God. That's all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you next time.